Before we jump into the app, quick reminder that nothing on Bell Curve is financial advice. Everything is just a meme. Hope you guys enjoy. The biggest benefactor of this as Elon grows is Apple. Because every single subscription that he sells, Apple is going to take 30%. Just as we were talking about last week. All right, guys. Welcome back to another roundup of Bell Curve. You got Michaels 1 and 2, Yano and Vance. Fellas, we got the quartet back together. It's nice. We've been uh, missing each other for a couple weeks here. Wow. Yeah. Yes, reunited. Blog, blog pod. Here we nice go. Nice to have the old gang back together. You know, how was Morocco, buddy? <laughs> I was going to say, it was. were you guys, I think you guys were all together. I was just kind of farting around in October, yeah, huh? But it's I not just, the same without you. Yeah, well, I know. I, know. I missed you guys. I missed you guys. I would I would have uh, dialed in from Morocco, but it doesn't seem like there's a uh, usable Wi-Fi in Morocco as as, uh, as Mike witnessed for <laughs> about a month ago. <laughs> need some helium hotspots out there, man. Seriously, it really do need some the helium people's hotspots. network. I, even it's the people's like, network. Yeah, the people's network was not <laughs> not working in Morocco. That's for sure. <laughs> a lot of supply, not much demand. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, we got a bunch. We actually got a bunch of stories this week, but I'd love to get your uh, all your takes on the the topic du jour on Twitter. Is uh, the, the chief twit, uh, Elon Musk himself, is going to be charging $8 for the blue check. So, um, been, been a lot of trolling uh, on it. What, what, p- people are very divided, right? There's the Elon is for free speech, and this is taking away a status symbol and, you know, going to eliminate the spam. And then there's the, this is just a, you know, billionaire coastal elite enriching himself. So, where do you, where do you guys fall on the whole uh, $8 for a blue check? I love it. People were trying to charge us like 10, 20 grand for, for checks. So it's good to see the price come down pretty significantly. Um, I, lo- I like what Elon's doing. Like, you know, I don't think ad based business models are that sustainable or really comport with the idea of, of freedom of speech being kind of the most important thing to a platform like this. Um, he's going to roll out Vine. I loved Vine when it was still alive. I'm, I think like maybe not having all of our children like being brainwashed by CCP propaganda on TikTok is, is a good idea. Maybe we should go away from that. So I think Vine is, is a great kind of counterbalance to that. Um, I think kind of the, the most unique perspective I have on the whole Twitter thing is like all of the, all of the alt, hist- uh, historically all of the alternative social networks have been these like conservative social networks. So like uh, Truther from Trump, you know, you have like Parler, like that was one. And like, it's kind of like, you know, you guys won't let us rabble rouse on the Twitter platform. So we're like, you know, we're going to go create our own. Now it's the opposite. All the lefties are like, you know, we're going to go move to Canada. We're going to like get off this platform. Like an, a, an alternative social network that's left leaning just like seems to me like it would be the lamest social platform you know, that could really be like existent. Like the Republicans want to go talk about like guns and crazy shit and property rights and all that stuff. What would like the left alternative version of like parlor or truther look like? Probably pretty lame. So I don't really see these people anywhere going anywhere. I see them paying $8. I think it's gonna be really funny when they do. Um, so yeah, really bullish on, on everything Elon's doing. So, so here, here's some interesting numbers. There's, there's about 350,000 blue check marks today. I think there's a a fair proportion of that that gets cannibalized. So let's say, you know, like 300 actually, you know, shell up and pay. How many? Oh, and then the other interesting stat is there are 37 million daily, monthly act, daily monetizable monthly active users. So basically people who are using Twitter every day just in the United States. So 37 million people who are in the United States using Twitter every day, who have like monetization potential, which you can kind of assume is a proxy for like not a bot, right? How many of those people just in the United States do you think will pay for this? You know, maybe over the next like six to 12 months. I basically ran very similar numbers. My, you did. my guess is in the like, yeah, I, it's in the like single digit millions, but it, but over three and probably less than eight. Yeah, that, that's what I was kind of thinking is like about 5 million people. Or something like that. I was looking at the overall yeah. Twitter because I, I do think the one thing is like what Jason and I were both just in Morocco, and one stat that I took away from that was you, people there make like two hundred fifty bucks, four hundred bucks a year American. So I was like, oh yeah, well no one, in, no one in Morocco is going to be a blue check. <laughs> then like that, that actually is not great. But uh, in America, it's like the it's like the biggest no brainer, right? Like for the American audience. Well. And he did say that it would be priced in local currency with proportional um, okay. uh, payment parity or, or payment um, purchase parity per country. There's going to be a lot of stuff that has to get figured out with that, I think. But like you could assume, you know, whatever eight dollars is in Morocco, that would be the equivalent. Um, the the really interesting point here 
uh, and this is my kind of like hottest take on this. I actually think Twitter is not the biggest benefactor of this. Uh, ultimately, let's say let's say eventually you get to like two to three billion dollars uh, worth of uh, you know basically just subscription revenue that Twitter is now generating. Maybe it's even more than that eventually. Like I I, I actually think Vine and all these new features, all these new capabilities. What Elon's going to do is kind of the same playbook as what Evan at Snap is running, or at least testing, which is instead of having an advertising-based business model, let's also try to just cram all of our best features, products, you know, all into a bundle and sell it for a subscription yeah. fee and have, you know, like the Snapchat, I can't remember what it's called at Snap, but it's like two ninety nine a month. It's pretty cheap, but that's going to be the Amazon Prime equivalent of what you know, basically these founders ultimately end up running. Because I agree with Vance. I think the philosophical approach of having a social network or some media property, you know, whatever it may be, without advertising is is the direction that I think the world is moving. And for a number of reasons, but the best way to do that is to have a subscription service that you start bundling all these things into. And so like when you release a new feature, when you release a new capability, when you have better targeting, tracking, better experience, better content consumption, like that goes to the Twitter blue check marks first. But the biggest benefactor of this as Elon grows is Apple. Because every single mm. subscription that he sells, Apple is going to take 30%, just as we were talking about last week. Wow. That was another update in, in the guidelines that Apple put out last week, which is that any sort of boost or post or promotional element, you know, like you can pay to promote your tweet, you can pay to promote your post in TikTok, all of those now have to fall through Apple IAP as well. So it, it, it is going to be something that's super beneficial to Twitter, but Apple's going to take their 30%. Dude, first of all, I love that take. I got Apple just – they've been crushing it, haven't they? They like really – remember there was a period of time where it was like, oh, is Facebook or Meta, right? They didn't want to flex too much because it was the rising app and they were like, who really has the power in this relationship? That has been fully decided in Apple's favor. They were very advantageous about when they, you know, chose to strike, you know, you know so to speak. So I kind of like that take on Twitter too. You know, you know, it's funny. If you think about uh, Andreessen Horowitz's original thesis on crypto, if you think about like what Chris Dixon would espouse in 2017 is that uh, blockchains are just new computers. Uh, and, and, and what's different about blockchains versus old computers is that with old computers, hardware was more powerful than software, right? You kind of unplug the computer and, you know, the software goes away. But with new block with blockchains, uh, they're computers where software is now more powerful than hardware, where, well, you're seeing in 2022, hardware still reigns supreme. I mean, there, there's, I, I don't like to, to promote other podcasts on our podcast, but uh, there's a great episode of Oddbox that just came out uh, talking all about the Apple moves basically against Facebook or Meta and, and Google. Um, Google and Apple are in an antitrust you know, lawsuit right now, essentially, which is a question as to whether or not Apple can continue to have, and they pay 12 to $14 billion a year for this, but the default search be uh, Chrome and default search be Google. Um, is that something that, you know, Apple will still be able to have? Well, Facebook is calling out very, very vocally that there are other antitrust questions to your point, Yano, as to whether or not Apple can continue to exert its power by owning the hardware. The reason why Apple is able to say that this is, you know, potentially not true is because Google exists, because Android has whatever 40 plus percent of market share and and apple can say hey we're not a monopoly we we happen to have the best product oh by the way every single one of those daily monetizable users or any sort of monetization of users in general from mobile devices comes from an ios device versus android it's like a 10x difference in terms of monetization but apple google exists and they're free in the marketplace to continue to grow their share and you know we're competitive with them in that respect so it's an interesting like they're kind of like fighting each other at different angles, but they're also collaborating at different angles. And, and it's just this weird, you know, different departments going to battle versus other departments who are in cahoots. Yeah. I, uh, you know, if, I don't know, like rough numbers for Twitter, uh, just in terms of like how big this blue check system could be, depending on the level of assumption that you want to make and how conservative you want to be. Um, you know, uh, Twitter did 5 billion in revenue last year. They lost uh, their net income on that was like negative two hundred and twenty million, depending on like if you if you want which is which is wild yeah um, I mean there are money losers since they IPO'd. There, there's another rumor that was reported by Bloomberg uh, that on Friday tomorrow uh, half of the staff will be let go. So assume that about half of that cost structure uh, goes away. Yep. Well, all right, that's pretty fair. I've you know it's you know it's so funny. We talked about this on the last show, right? Him walking in with a kitchen sink. 
And he's like, throw it all out with a kitchen sink or whatever. That's just a different attitude and way to live, man. I, I don't even know how to interpret that uh, action, but he is certainly built different. Uh, I love it. Everyone needs yeah. some of that in their lives. Just like the burn it down, start over, work from first burn principle. Yeah. So yeah. I, I have two thoughts on this. One is I fully agree with Michael that, um, that like I think social media will end up moving towards subscription based uh, or at least Twitter will end up moving more towards a subscription based. You start throwing really good stuff at it. It's like, yeah, how many, what percentage of, of that? I forget the numbers you guys were throwing out, but like what percentage of the users will pay for a blue check? I don't know, 2% or something, 3%. Great. Now what percentage of people will pay for like a much, much better DMing? Like DMs and Twitter are an absolute nightmare. Anytime I'm, in, I'm on DMs, I'm like, let's move it to Telegram. If it was much better DMs, I, you know, maybe that gets another 3%. Boom. If you get like a Vine-like service, that's another 3%. No ads, that's another 3%. And now you've got 15% of the total Twitter base paying for, you know, five bucks a month or eight bucks a month. Then like that, that's a really good business yeah. right there. You get some stuff. I mean, think about, think about what Amazon has done. Yeah. At first it yeah. was free shipping. Then it was free shipping plus movies. Now it's free shipping plus movies plus NFL Thursday night. <laughs> Which admittedly have been terrible games, but you get my point. And, and... <laughs> yeah. You know who originally did this business model uh, and they don't get a lot of credit for it? It's actually Costco. And like they basically strive to like break even on their entire business and they just have that uh, $50 a year membership. And I kind of love their business model even more than Amazon because it's basically just like they have a huge warehouse. They just plonk a bunch of shit down on boxes and they're like, here you go. Come pick it up. <laughs> it's so simple and easy like here's a fancy business for you a lot of shit on the floor come get it and it's just like a phenomenal phenomenal business but yeah that and and so if you start to back in and like let's say uh you know of those just just us users right you want to take something relatively conservative and say you get like five percent i know you said two percent you know i would do this in a heartbeat you know i've heard all these people be like oh this is prohibitively expensive this is nothing for a blue check on twitter like it's eight bucks a month. It's one coffee in New York. Here, well, here, here, here's what we'll end up here. Yeah, I, I mean, it's 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 nothing. I think a large amount of people will do it. I would do it in a heartbeat. I think a, mo- most of the people that I know would do it in a heartbeat. But I don't think maybe that we're the, the, the majority here. I think a lot of people might be skept- skeptical. What ends up happening that converts a lot of people is when they start changing the algorithm to promote the blue checks only, right? Yeah. So like, if you have a blue check, you're going to show up in replies. If you don't have a blue check, you don't show up in replies. If you don't have a blue check, like you have to pay to get your tweet promoted to get seen by more than 1% of your followers. If you have a blue check, maybe 10% of your followers see your tweet. So like, that's what you'll end up having like two factions of Twitter. You have like a blue check faction where like their stuff gets seen and they're like, it's almost like the anons and not anons. Doesn't um, that already sort of exist to some degree though? Like you're the, you're the one with the blue check here, but right. Don't, don't, when you, people reply to you, there's a blue check and a non blue check and people usually the old blue checks really only check the blue check part of it. So it's very rare to get response. Right. Didn't you say that? People see my tweets cause they're just better yeah. than yours usually, but, but I, but, <laughs> I'm getting roasted here. no, but I, I, no, no, there is, there is like a little on my notifications. Actually, I have like normal notifications and then I have notifications for only verified people. It's like the verified notifications center which is pretty elitist. Um, wow. It's elitist at its classes. Very, very elitist of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's the last thing on Twitter. Uh, and then we can move into crypto stuff is um, I have a lot of friends. I know you guys, I think Vance, you worked at Netflix, maybe. And Michael, you worked at Dropbox and Snap. Like I have friends at Facebook and Instagram and things like that. Their lives are cushy. Like their lives are very, very, very cushy. This is the end of that period in time of the last decade where like you could kind of be like, late 20s early 30s mid 30s kind of getting a lot of money you're working at like a big tech company in, in san francisco and like you're making bank you're making way more than like your friends in, like in investment banking who are like grinding their asses off and i think i think this is the you know, stripe just laid off 14 percent. big big layoffs across the board everywhere twitter's obviously going to do big layoffs and um yeah this is the end of that phase that's the open secret of silicon valley these technology companies can be run with 30 40 percent of the staff they have today and just be absolute cash cows and yeah i mean you kind of look at a lot of them right now and they look like they're at the end of their own kind of like technological history like meta and the metaverse like we'll see if that's a growth avenue like potentially probably not like snap doesn't have anything around the corner that's going to like blow people away it's probably more of the same more of the same is the prognosis for a lot of these tech companies and i don't think that lends to an environment where you can run these huge costs and expect nobody to not throw up on it so you know when when risk appetites come back i think like the last point on this is like 
all the hedge fund managers, all the guys that we talk to, a lot of them trading growth stocks. And like, you know, what do you do when the economy is, is going to be ripping or rates are going to be coming down or you think like the prognosis for a recession is strong and then you're going to get, you know, easing. What do you do? You just buy a bunch of growth stocks and, you know, you make a bunch of money and then you can go home. If that lever is no longer available, it's going to have to be something else. Mm. Like they're probably going to go off and look more seriously at crypto if that wave is, you know, noticeably crested. Um, and, I, you know, it's even today, like NASDAQ's down a bunch, S&P's down a bunch, crypto's up. It's like you're starting to see these things that are like, you know, indicative as to where the, the next you know run goes. Hey, anecdotally, I feel like crypto, I mean, we're just at the, you know, the total, uh, you know, the edge of risk assets. I feel like our downturn kind of just happened faster than the broader market. Like some friends of mine, like we kind like Blockware, we kind of went through this, like we realized that demand was slowing you know, back in May. And now like a bunch of my friends and companies on like, you know, consulting or banking or whatever, they're like, yeah, like things are starting to like slow down, like management is starting to talk. And it's like, it's just, I think it just is trickling through. And now everyone's feeling it, big tech included. Like we talked about it last week, but Meta got slammed, Amazon got slammed. Yeah. I mean, everyone's feeling it, I think. Except for Berkshire Hathaway. Buffett's coming out looking real good right now. <laughs> looking great for you. Per usual, looking guys, look at he's flat on the year, looking great. <laughs> I, I think he's literally still underperformed the S and P five hundred over the past thirty years, even with the performance this year. Like, I, I know I was cherry, I was cherry, I was looking at a chart of uh, it was like Meta, Nvidia, Netflix, and Tesla, everything down like forty five to seventy five percent, and Berkshire's like flat. It's like Warren Buffett's looking pretty good. Yeah, la- last thing I'll say on this, I'm I'm sure you guys have seen like the TikTok videos of like what is the day in the life of a product manager at Facebook or whatever. I'm not even sure that that is accurate. Um, from like a that's what that is an actual person who works at that actual company, but I will be able I can absolutely attest that that is 100% accurate for for what the lifestyles are like for many of the people that work at these businesses. Lighting a fire under those companies. I mean, I I, I really had a friend who works in private equity and, and they focus on like, you know, not large cap um, tech, but they have done some large cap stuff. And <clears throat> every year they kind of go through this process within their investment committee of like, what if we like went off and, you know, did what Elon did and like bought Twitter and like cut half the staff and like got the average revenue per, per uh, employee back to like equal par, you know, like what would that look like? The problem is going back to this from last week, governance. And so one of the really interesting things is the the companies that are going to outperform in this are going to, I think, are going to be the ones that have a really fair check and balance on the governance model of those businesses, of those corporations. Um, Because if you have 21 or 10 to 1 or 0 to 1 or or 1 to 0 voting, uh, how are you going to be able to go in and make structured changes if that's not in line with what the CEO founder wants to do? Um, and so it, it's going to be really interesting to look back in a year from now, as we're seeing some of these positive changes at Twitter, talking about what we talked about last week with governance. Like, I, I do think that we're going to see a marked difference between how Twitter performs and how something like Meta performs. I, I'd love to, um, you know, check in actually on just what's going on in, in the private market. So public uh, public market, co- like super, super visible, right? Um, obviously, like public market indices taking a dive. Crypto tokens have taken a dive uh, over the last like six to nine months. Um you know, I, I think we talked on the show a little bit about just how overheated venture was in general. Um, so maybe we could actually start just because we're talking about kind of big tech right now. If you want to talk about like venture generally, like what parts are still alive and doing well and then what parts are struggling. And then maybe we could move more specifically into private markets for crypto. Um, but would love to just get your take on like what's going on in the venture scene, like what valuations are at. There, so like what's happened the past few weeks is that the class of 2021 who raised in, you know, January, February, March of last year when the bull run was really in its, you know, heavy part uh, have come back to market and are trying to raise it similar valuations. And, and people are just not there in terms of the demand. And they're starting to re-rate everything downwards. And so like, you know, we saw a project you know, two days ago, can't mention who it was, but they were trying to raise it like a $400 million fully diluted valuation, pre-product, pre-launch, pre-everything. Um, and those are just the things that like are just no longer happening. And the higher side of the like the that size of range kind of sets the tone for everything before it. And so we're probably in the midst of, you know, a, a 60, 70, 80 percent correction in the private markets. Um, and that is setting the tone for everything, because, you know, when people ask you why you're not willing to pay, you can just point to a lot of the public comps and be like, listen, this is the outcome if you execute on everything. Um, so it's uh, it's certainly changing a lot, changing for the better. 
Um, the different subsectors are kind of d performing differently. Like there's still a lot of heat on things like Aptos, um, like, you know, FTX Alameda is kind of like setting the floor for projects there. But outside of that, it's uh, it's kind of a feast or famine market, depending on if you have traction and metrics and revenue or if you don't. The, the way I'd break it down is um, you kind of have like a two by two. You've got like crypto or Web3 and then you've got like early crypto and, and uh, you know, Web2 uh, and then you've got early stage, late stage. And in it, it, we're, we're obviously not ones who um, transact very frequently in things that are non crypto, uh, but we have a lot of friends who do and kind of keep our ear to the ground in terms of what's happening. The late stage Web2 side of the world is, is dead. No deal are getting done. And, and what I mean here is like B series B plus. Um, and so usually at a multi hundred million dollar valuation and you're raising 50 to a, to $200 million. Um, a lot of those deals stopped being done basically a year ago. So to Vance's other point, you know, on like the classes of different startups, um, you're going to have to see some of those businesses come back to market pretty soon. Um, and it's going to be really interesting because usually the way that this stuff plays out is you don't start off, you know, coming back to market and you say, okay, I've got, uh, you know, I'm going to just do a down round. It, it usually starts off as we need to raise more capital, but what I'm going to add to it is like structure to this new round. And what structure usually means, it's it's usually like liquidation preferences, downside protection, um, you know, covenants in the actual agreement itself that protect the investor or give the investor some guaranteed return. So that if the company doesn't make it to that valuation again or sells for something less, like they get the money back. In some cases, they get the money back twice before anybody else gets anything. So like these can be pretty, pretty restrictive. Um, so you'll see structured rounds, but you won't actually tell that they're structured round because it'll just say, hey, we raise another X amount at our same valuation. The next laid to fall will be uh, actual down rounds. And, and that's where it's like we need capital and we're willing to take a 40, 50, 60 percent haircut on our valuation. And we haven't really seen a lot of that yet. Um, I would imagine that that probably happens in like the early half of or the first half of next year as people really need capital and to survive um, and they're willing to take the dilution. Um, and so all of this is to say, like, this is what's happening kind of across the board. But what happens on that later stage side is it eventually trickles down to, the, to what Vance was saying as well is like it, you can point to these things and be like, hey, look, like they did a structured round or like, hey, look, they actually did a down round. So when you're, you know, a Series A company and you raise your seed at 50 and you're like, well, I at least need a 2x for my Series A, like, sorry, like, you're going to have to have, like, a bridge Series A because this is actually worth 40, but, like, we'll do it at 50, you know? It, it's, you know, same valuation as last time or, like, there's a structured component to it or, and, and so I think there's going to be, there's still a lot of pain on the horizon, I think, um, and, and frankly, a lot of this stuff hasn't trickled all the way down yet it, it has started to trickle in the later stages but it hasn't gotten to the early stages yet um but there are still like pretty reasonable deals getting done at the early stages so it, it, at least there is flow of, of business and transactions i mean we're like as busy as we've ever been frankly from the venture side but we are only like seed in series a and, and from that respect it's just not it's not really like an underwriting process as you look at if you're you know writing a 50 million dollar check it's more like who's the team what's the product what's the market um, so it's a very different evaluation process, but later stage venture right now is, is getting crushed. Painful. How do you think a lot of startups with six months of, of runway left? How do you think about what's a better strategy? So uh, if you're a late stage company, like let's say you're Series C, Series D, you raised at a five billion dollar valuation a year ago. You now have the option to either cut. Uh, I'm going to go drastic. You have the you have the opportunity or the ability to cut like eighty percent of your team, pull back drastically. You cut eighty percent of your costs. Uh, and you just kind of drag this out so that you don't have to raise a down round or you're like, all right, I'm maybe only going to lay off like 10, 15 percent of people uh, and just like keep growing market share, keep kind of going to market, building product, hiring devs, uh, but raise like a big down round at like maybe 70 percent haircut. What's a what's the better strategy there? It, it's so I, dependent on what that business is. Like if yeah. you have a capital light business and you can cut 50 percent and not like kill your growth 50 percent, then that's obviously the thing to do. You know, there, there are a lot of these businesses, as we're talking about that, you know, like the, the Googles of the world who have the same affliction that are private five billion dollar companies who just like have a ton of people there. Like, why do they have a ton of people there? It doesn't really make a ton of sense. I think that leaning out in those cases makes the most sense, obviously. 
But it, here and and here's another interesting tidbit. I, I think what's going to happen though, no matter what, whether you raise at a lower valuation or not, is that the investors and the boards of these companies are going to push for lower valuations internally. And and so what I mean by this is. You've done a 409A valuation. That's like your b basic bare bones accounting valuation based on revenue and like growth and public multiples. So that's one thing. That's how you value like the strike price of options when you're giving options to employees. What I think will also happen is you're going to start to see, you know, investors in these later rounds that sit on these boards push for internal lower valuations across the entire company. So if you sold pr preferred shares at $5 billion, they'll push for a re-rating of what those what that like internal valuation is to like two or three just be based on market comps alone and one one piece of information that i saw on twitter which unsubstantiated anecdotal is uh and there's a secondary marketplace for lp interest in these venture funds what's happening right now is the the marketplace for these venture funds is clearing at on average a 40 percent discount to where the book value is relative to where these where these investments are marked um, and so what that suggests to me is that the LPs in these venture funds already know that these things are going to take probably a 40% haircut at some point and that they're willing to buy them at that price because either they think that that's attractive or they want to you know, be able to get access to those funds. Usually there's, there's some sort of inflation there. So like maybe, you know, it's actually a 50% discount, but they're willing to buy them at 40 to get access to that fund. But yeah, I mean, I, I think there's going to be a lot of carnage, you know, internal, external valuations, like a lot of that's going to change. The tough part is it just ta it takes quarters and years because you either have to go through an internal valuation change or you have to go through a new fundraise. So some of these venture funds are just like done, like the growth stage ones. Like you look at like the hot deals that closed over the past two years. Like I was looking on uh, Michael Dempsey, who manages another fund, sent me a sheet. That's like 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 a name like Andrel, you know, like American Dynamism, very contemporary in terms of you know shipping uh, Ukraine weapons. 80% discount. Like, how do you square that with your LPs when you made this huge bet on them, you know, six or 12 months ago? Like, I think some of, like, there's a, Web2 VC is really bloated. There's like 100 times as many firms as there are in, in crypto. You're going to see the whole middle section of that market get cut. And I think really the, the dynamic moving forward is like the best Web2 funds, the good web three funds because there's just not that many of them and that's the whole package but everyone else is going to be shit out of luck in in my opinion what about um I, i'd be curious like within the specific uh stages of crypto so there's like seed series a series b whatever in crypto i mean is there like like one thing i've just found kind of tricky or just i'm trying to figure out it's like we all saw Andreessen raise like four billion dollars right like right at the top um and i assume most of that is or a good portion of that is undeployed i'm just like trying to do math on like how long you know you have to deploy that amount of money and it, you have to do pretty rapid deal making um and i'm wondering if there are a couple big funds like that with you know dry powder on the sidelines basically is the dry powder on the sideline thing is that actually going to be enough to like sustain valuation somewhat or do you guys just see yeah, I mean, is is it just going to be this slow unwind of valuations in the next six to eight months? Keep, keep in mind with, you know, those funds that are crypto, like Andreessen, I don't have any information on them, but like I can imagine that this is the case. Like they're also not just putting that into private deals. You know, they're, they're probably buying liquid assets. Um, and how much of that goes into liquid? How much does it? I mean, if liquid gets more attractive and valuations are still the same, you would naturally think that it kind of shifts from a portfolio allocation perspective. So like, I don't think like four and a half is really like, you know, dry powder, right? Um, if it's sustaining private valuations. The other thing too is like, it, if there aren't attractive deals, it's also hard to justify. There's two ways to get in trouble as a venture firm. Number one, missing something. So why weren't you in that deal? That thing turned into a hundred billion dollar Facebook. The second one is why did you put that much money into that one? And really being able to justify that when you looked over the, ter the tear sheet next fundraise and it's like okay you are the board partner on that you put 50 million into that like let's go back over why and like revisit your investment thesis so i think there is potential you know career risk in some of these situations for putting large amounts of capital as a multi-billion dollar fund does uh or has to into into some you know you know things that we're talking about now could potentially be overvalued to, to be clear, like not all the startups are dead. Like you kind of see two types right. of charts. One is like 
our revenue was mostly a bull market phenomenon. We're leveraged, super leveraged the cycle of users, KPI, you know, users adoptions, you know, people trading shit coins and NFTs, things like that. Like that's kind of like one chart that you see. I would say that's probably 80% of the charts that we see in terms of like people pitching us stuff. The other 20% are like, we're about to break our bull run all time high monthly revenue. We have a clear path to 10 X this, um, and like, we're just going to keep executing. Those are the startups we're, we're just telling them here's more money try to buy your competitors out of the marketplace in terms of just growing your market share, hiring more people. Um, the problem with those deals, like the deals that are you know up and to the right in terms of revenue, those are like series A, series B companies. Um, that's not something quite yet that you can put a hundred million into at a billion dollar valuation and buy 10%. Like that's gonna take a few years. And so I think what you do is you know you have to do different things if you have a, a very large fund you have to do liquid you have to wait the market out to let these companies mature um but it's not going to be the same playbook as as the bull run like i think we've kind of said goodbye to that for at least a couple of years like like giving you know like giving uh open you know 400 million dollars at a 13 and a half billion dollar valuation ditto alchemy you know giving moonbird 60 million you know like those are the things which are going to be your LPs are just going to ask questions um, around how this works and, and how does it generate revenue at scale. Um, we got a couple more stories before we're going to do. Uh, so Coinbase is going to be releasing earnings in 10 minutes from now. So we can take a look at those once they go live. But we've got JP Morgan and their uh, Ave fork in trade. Uh, and we've also got NFT uh, leaning further into, or sorry, Jesus, Instagram leaning. Let's talk about FTX. Okay. Let's, let's talk about Alameda. FTX. I want to talk about yeah. Alameda because I want to give Vance's take right. on uh, that here because uh, I feel like Vance might have something spicy. But the, the, the high level, and I haven't looked into this too much, is uh, so Coin, Coindesk had uh, uh, had some good reporting earlier today or yesterday. Uh, I think it was Ian Allison over there. Uh, per Coindesk, Alameda Research has $14.5 billion of assets um, against $8 billion of liabilities. Uh, what's interesting is when you dig into the assets, $3.5 billion is FTT. That's unlocked, I think. Two over two of that is FTT that's locked uh, or that's like collateral in other DeFi protocols, which like some weird protocols actually too, some weird pools. Then there's like another three and a half billion of crypto. Most of that is Solana or like a, over a billion of that is Solana. And a lot of that Solana is locked Solana. Basically, they've got this like huge bout, like 14 and a half billion is this huge number. But when you actually dig into the assets, uh, A, a large number, a large amount of that is... Uh, is, is these assets that are like deeply connected to to FTX with FTT and with Solana too. And furthermore, uh, a lot of the, where they've put that, a lot of the like collateral that they have is uh, against these like FTT tokens, which Alameda, which is like kind of the quasi trading arm of FTX or like linked to it, obviously very directly um, ho holds, you know, sometimes 99% of it. So I don't know, like Vance, when you start digging into this kind of a balance sheet, what, what kind of flags go up? Obviously, there are probably some red flags. Like, what, what, what do you start thinking? Yeah, so on an asset basis, the first thing that stands out is that Alameda owns over 10% of Solana, um, which is like, you know, a token distribution that I've never seen in my entire life. Um, and so, you know, it just gives you a sense of uh, how much of the network they own um, and what their priority stack ranking is. Um, and I think they have a lot of soul. But the bigger one is the FTT, right? Like that is clearly the strategically most important asset on their balance sheet. It's the one where they're collateralizing the most with it on DeFi and CeFi, borrowing stables or whatever against it. Um, but it's like the problem with these two assets and, and you know, really holding large assets that are semi-liquid at scale right now is that if you had to sell, you know, a billion of Solana, the market just would not be able to digest that especially when the potential largest buyer of it is you. Like, you know, usually like when we trade coins, we know who we're trading against. It's either Jump or Alameda or like maybe Wintermute if they're trading that day. But like the participant set is not infinite. And so I think the overall takeaway here is that uh, Alameda is probably in, in not as great a position as, as we would have thought otherwise. I don't think they're like financially insolvent or anything like that. I th just think this is kind of like what happens in a bear market when you have to manage your liquidity. But it's certainly not a great look. And having $8 billion of liabilities against a bunch of a liquid stuff, you know, if things really turn down, that, that's also a huge problem. And it, and it kind of leads into this illiquidity problem, which I was talking about. Um, 
So what do they do? I think Alameda makes a lot of money. You know, they're probably making a couple hundred to five hundred million dollars a year would be my guess off of this balance sheet um, in this like current yield environment. So they certainly have cash flow. But um, yeah, I, I think just things are, are less you know stable than I would have expected, frankly. Um, and the balance sheet is much larger and much more liquid than I would have thought. One, one is question, it, you know, it is uh, how much did you say they have of unlocked FTT? Three point six billion, I think. I mean, the the entire market cap of FTT, which suggests the liquid amount of FTT, is three point three billion right now. So let's assume that these numbers are slightly off, or that FTT has gone down. I don't know where it was trading on June thirtieth. Like they own all of the FTT, or at least all of the liquid trading FTT, and I don't know exactly how the buyback and burn or the or the buyback works. But do they actually burn the FTT or do you just get to buy it? So so the way the buyback works and the rough numbers are they're they're burning about four or five million dollars a week. Um, right. and like this kind of like really makes you think like if you're SBF like or you're Alameda, like what are you thinking? Um, what I'm thinking is I really need to defend the price of FTT. And so it, it makes a lot of sense that they're putting this much money on a weekly basis into doing that. Like that's a lot of money they could just be, you know, putting into Alameda or FTX or whatever. So like that makes sense. The second thing I'm trying to do is get out of the soul or, or at least slowly, you know, manage my liquidity to a better position. Or like, frankly, like build up Solana DeFi so that I can actually put in a couple billion dollars of Sol and draw, you know, a few hundred million of stablecoins against it. So like, there are a lot of kind of like strategic options which come out of just looking at this balance sheet. Um, but I think most of them have to do with selling, not not buying or or borrowing more. You know, getting more leverage. So here's, there, a, here's a counterpoint. Sorry, go ahead, Yano. I'm just gonna say if you uh, you should you guys should pull up the coin coin gecko charts for FTT and Solana. I was gonna say this too. They, I was gonna. They there's it, very there's there's interesting price action, which is they both fell to thirty bucks. They're kind of just going down. They fell to thirty bucks. They're just there's basically an infinite bid. There's been an infinite bid at thirty dollars since kind of the exact same day, which is like the first week of June. So I don't know what's going on there, but like. I don't know. There's just this infinite bid at thirty dollars for both those assets since the first week of June, and like they just don't budge from thirty. Yeah. So like when I when like when I look at the Solana every day, like how I can tell if it's like a bad day or a good day generally, or if it's over or above thirty dollars or under or or below uh, thirty dollars, like that kind of broke last week, and and FTT is now at twenty four. Like figuring out what the re-rating of these could be in the context of their balance sheet and what that forces them to do, especially when you look at something like Magic Internet Money, uh, which is a protocol which produces a stablecoin, and almost forty percent, seventy million dollars of their backing collateral is FTT. You know, you have like the potential for like a toxic asset spiral in the same way that you had, um, you know, Luna and UST and and uh, you know, like the move if if uh, if you really um, want to play this is probably. Um, putting in FTT as to collateral to a place that you think is semi-dangerous, borrowing assets against that, and you know, leaving people with bad debt. That's unfortunately but that, like. But isn't that what they've so, been so that isn't, was, that, isn't that what this kind of just showed that they've been doing, which is putting FTT right? Yeah. yeah. In, right. Yeah. And then, and then and then let yeah. me let me extend that further. Is this a? Uh, does it make? Does it seem like you know they they came out in this bear market? They're like you know they're they're on the offensive like the you know the cover of magazines saying SBF is the white knight. Does it make you think though that like a lot of the capital that they're using to for these acquisitions of maybe a Voyager or a Blackfire, or whoever it may be, is them just putting an FTT into these pretty like dangerous pools like a MIM, getting stables out and then using that to capitalize acquisitions? It would make you it would make you think that. The 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 the, the so you kind of touched on it, but like what I was gonna say is it this could be like the completely rational strategy. Uh, and what happens if FTT like goes away, goes to zero, like gets, you know, however many billions of dollars of locked FTT is liquidated on market. Like what actually happens in that instance? I, I don't know. Like it, there really isn't anything that kind of ha really happens because of that, because FTTX is just going to continue on in the same way that it is. It just won't have the burn or the burn will be burning a ton of FTT. So like that's, that's the thing that's holding it up. Um, Alameda loses a balance sheet item, but or a balance sheet liability, but they gain the asset that they have borrowed as collateral, 
like which is you know a massive multi-billion dollar position like i, I could see a world where everything just kind of like blows up and it's still okay right or am i missing something honestly i'd forgotten about ftt until like it came up in this context like i didn't know that it was eight billion dollars fully diluted that it had you know this this type of profile or was this important to them strategically um i think other people realizing this is going to make the outcome where you know they really try to test the liquidity of ftt more likely um just like you know when people knew that the dough was potentially in a position of weakness like we saw a lot of people that we know try to basically short it and, and take shots at them like that's kind of what happens um when when people realize it I don't think it's like an all good, you can just walk away style scenario. I think you have the collapse of at least five or 10 DeFi protocols. Um, and then you have the the cycle down of, of the Solana asset because people will know that that's the only other assets on their balance sheet if FTT spirals. Um, so it's like, there's this combinatorial effect, which I don't think is just like, it's all good. I, th I think this is like potentially very risky, but it feels like SBF is rich enough where he could just backstop it from FTX as well. So mm. I don't know how it works. And this is why uh, F they're raising more money right now. <laughs> I feel like if Alameda saw themselves in the market, they would poach them. You know what I mean? Like when, when Alameda saw <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Celsius offside on the Steeth trade, they like po they made them crumble. Right? I feel like if Alameda saw themselves, they would take them out here. Because, yeah, they're very levered to the price of Seoul. I've also – maybe we should talk – I don't know. I I've heard rumors that uh, – like Alameda, FTX, SBF, whatever. However, whatever entity he's working through is basically supporting the price of Sol at thirty bucks. But I think these are unfounded rumors that I've yeah I've heard around the water cooler. We, we don't know. The the only thing I'll say about these scenarios is like I'm in this group chat with a bunch of fund managers. Uh, like I think Sue and Kyle used to be in the chat, and they've since been kind of you know kicked out. But like it went from well, you know what everybody. Would have, what those guys? They're good guys. <laughs> It went. It went from every being everybody being like buddy buddy to people being like, where where's where's three arrows strike price? Like where's where's the map? Like people trying to like basically hunt them while they were still in the Telegram group. It's like, you know, people. It's vicious out there. Um, and so you kind of need to carry like a big stick and and threaten people with it every once in a while. Um, but in the Do Quan scenario, that didn't really help that much. You know, so it's like. You need a lot of capital to defend an eight billion dollar coin or a twelve billion dollar coin. Like, what do you guys think of these interviews that he's doing? Have you seen any of these at like the Unchained interview or the the Coinage one or whatever? Yeah. Have you watched any of them? The the Doe yeah. interviews. Yeah. I kind of I I'm, I'm waiting for the interviews. Those are the ones which I'm the most interested in. For the, for the what? The Sue and Kyle interviews. Oh, they yeah. gave one in Bloomberg. Did you see this? Yeah, I need I need to see the video, you know, them talking. I want to see the just like the whole vibe. But the Do, the Doquan interviews are are strange. Um, it doesn't seem possible that he's still out there, just living his life, and like also on Twitter. Um, I don't know if I get much from it other than it didn't work, and a lot of people got hurt. It's probably the only real take that matters, honestly. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't seem like the, the end of the FTX story. Uh, we can move past FTX, but I feel like there's, the, I think this FTX thing is going to be in the. I, I think this is the this. start. This is not the end. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. For the, for the record, I am, I am like on the team of like, I think they're solvent. I hope they're solvent. Oh, I do too. I'm too. not, I'm ready yeah. for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think where like usually where there's smoke, there's fire. People are going to be looking at this. It's a bear market. These are the things that happen in bear markets. They also just allocated a bunch of capital. Like, if I'm BlockFi, I'm fingers crossed, like their deal still goes through, you know, like I'm, I, this is, these are just the things that happen in bear markets. So keep in mind, like you guys are in this business, like everyone is reading these articles for a reason. Somebody decided to leak this to the press for a reason. Like, you know, somebody didn't just stumble upon this. Um, and so like, I wonder what that is, is, is kind of my other question. hundred mm. percent. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, I mean, maybe this is like even too simple of a take, but if you had made me guess what does Alameda's balance sheet look like, this is just not what I would have thought it resembled. I, I, I thought would, it would be like Bitcoin. You think it's, a bunch I of thought cash. I would have said too. You, you don't think it would, it would, it would uh, resemble a, a retail trader? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, we got some suit, we got some rocket pool. But like, think, think of it this way too. Like, 
If I told you that a VC that had a tendency to sell owned 10% of a coin that you thought was going to go up, like, that doesn't seem to fit logically. Like, you're going to have a serious headwind when Solana comes back, in my opinion, just because this liquidity situation looks like it needs to be managed, and it feels like Alameda is going to be, you know, pretty on the ball when it comes to getting more cash on their balance sheet if this is really what it looks like. Yeah. I wonder if they're just trying to wait it out. I mean, that that, that was my kind of very simple take, is I, I kind of just think they're looking at this being like, yeah, eventually, in maybe it's one year, two years, or whatever, bull market will return, liquidity will come back to FTT and Solana and all that stuff, and they can exit, you know, at a, a pretty good position, I would say. But I, I was just surprised that it wasn't, I, th I, I thought it would have been like 50% cash is their portfolio. I was just surprised that this is how it looked, to be honest. Um, it it kind of just means those assets are going to be range bound. Like they can't let them drop below a certain threshold or else their liabilities, some something probably happens. Maybe they get margin called, yeah. maybe they get reached out to, you have to repay your loans early. But on the other side, you know, if it runs too high, like that's a liquidity situation which you now need to manage. And so like you kind of have this bounded outcome for at least the near term of, of those coins just because of the liquidity position they're in. Yeah. So you're saying there's an SBF put on, on Solana? I very much do. <laughs> I tweeted this. I tweeted this when he was originally talking about buying Bitcoin. I very much do think there is an SBF put, you know, around, he said it was around 17 or 16K Bitcoin. I don't know what that would be for Solana, probably like $22, $25. Um, but yeah, when, when like the richest person in crypto tells you there's a put, you kind of got to believe them. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I would love to, uh, I think maybe we could talk about Instagram uh, moving deeper into nfts uh in general i'm not sure if you guys um uh heard about this but basically they uh instagram announced you know do you actually want to talk about this story i feel like you were you had some thoughts on it yeah i mean let's um let's do ave for a second okay. ave and jp morgan because i think that will segue because that was also on polygon that'll segue into instagram in a second um and i've just been spending more time with the jp morgan i was i've been talking to tyrone ty from jp morgan all morning about the deal so i know just a little bit more about it um basically singapore is very into crypto singapore has been very pro crypto for a long time uh they have something called the monetary 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 authority of singapore mas um they have project guardian to basically get more into crypto they went to jp morgan um to basically do a, a crypto experiment and so what what they actually did here is uh jp morgan built this essentially permissioned it's really a permission DeFi thing uh built on it was, it was a fork of ave arc um, and what they did is they tokenized, they worked with uh, Singapore's largest bank, which is DBS, um, and then a, a Tokyo uh, Bank, which is SBI. And they basically tokenized JPY, uh, the yen, and they tokenized SGD, um, which is the Singapore dollar. And uh, they put it in, they basically created like a, a pool, essentially, in, in, uh, in this like forked version of Ave Arc on Polygon. Um, and, and they swapped assets on it. So it was like super permissioned, like about as permissioned DeFi as you can get. Um, but it was, I mean, it was a live cross currency transaction on a fork of Ave Arc, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, that's the, that's, that's the overview. Um, they're, they're, they're I hope first, which I can talk about, but yeah. What do, what do you guys think about this? I hope this is the start of uh, a longer term commitment to doing these things and bringing clients on chain. It feels like a lot of these bank pilots end in like, okay, we're going to go build our own permission blockchain. Thanks for trying it out live in the public. Or like they just don't have the follow through. But these are the things that we need to be doing. I'm glad that Polygon's BD team is like strong enough and also shows that they're pretty dynamic. They can do the gaming stuff. They can do the big institutional stuff. Um, TBD, how much value this actually brings to crypto. It's usually not a huge problem getting them to come to crypto. It's a problem getting them to stay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, bullish, but we'll see. Yeah, I, th I mean, JP Morgan's been working on blockchain stuff for a long time, right? You remember like Amber Day? I don't know how long you guys have known the blockchain team course, over there. Yeah. Like Amber, yeah, Clover now, like Christine Moy. Uh, yeah, Christine Moy worked really hard on building the blockchain team over there. Um, and they, they've been building, you know, they had Quorum, if you guys remember that, back in like 2015, oh, yeah. 2016, the fork of Ethereum. Then I think Consensus took that over. Uh, like York Roads at Microsoft was managing it for a little bit, I think. But so JP Morgan's been working on this for like a decade. I don't think it does much for DeFi, honestly. But what I think it does is um, 
if you read Ty, so that guy Ty Lobon is, I think is his last name. If you read his thread about this, that is a crypto savvy person. Like he's talking about zero knowledge proofs. He's talking about forking of a arc. Uh, he, he posted actually the transaction hashes to, to on Polygon scan. Like that is a crypto savvy team over there. And I think what it does is it makes other banks realize, like it makes other institutions realize, oh, oh crap. Like, oh wow. Like people are taking this seriously. Oh, okay. People are doing this thing. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and it also pushes regulators to say like, oh, like these like Ave pools, these lend and borrow platforms, like these, oh, like real people are using these? Like, ah, crap. Okay. Like I, I need to figure out what's going on here. So I, I think it's net positive. We need the narrative when it's a bit strange that it's on a POA chain. Um, like, you know, ostensibly you'd build this on ETH, but it's positive. Sorry, this is a really dumb question. What's a POA chain? Proof of authority, authority. basically like a permission validator set for Polygon. That's how their current chain works. Got it. Um, I have a, yeah, I mean, there there are other, I want to actually ask you guys a question about Polygon in a sec after we talk about the Instagram story. But um, the other interesting thing here was uh, they said, I I think they're on chain, they they built this like in-house on-chain verification thing. Um, and, and he said, he's like, look, the design of this wasn't perfect. Um, but he said that, uh, he's like, there's no possible way we could have gotten into DeFi without KYC going through like compliance and KYC. Yep. And he's like, in the future, we at JP Morgan hope to actually use zero knowledge proofs for this. So I think like, hmm. it's cool to see them pushing the edge of, uh, of innovation on the DeFi side of things. I mean, this, this just furthers the, the thesis that public permission DeFi is how institutions will interact if they want to interact. Yeah, you, you have to be permissioned. It's just no, there's yeah. no question. Yeah, they also built their own in-house wallet, which is cool. Like they built this institutional wallet where traders couldn't access any company funds. Uh, only approved DeFi protocols could be used. Um, and then VCs were like, I think they, I think they, they had some sort of like, there's some sort of process thing where uh, I don't know a lot. Like they built their own institutional wallet, which was really cool. So, yeah. Um, I think it's a cool development. I'm uh, I'm curious what you think of this, Mike. Like Ave Arc and Permission DeFi, and we, we explored this in season one of Bell Curve and talked to Ben Foreman about it on the podcast. I'm just curious to get your take on this. Um, yeah, I have like a pretty hard time getting. I think it's like a great. I think it's, I basically agree with what we've said. Like it's a it's a positive development. Yeah. It's hard for me to feel like super excited about things because kind of like maybe this a POC, maybe it goes somewhere, but like maybe it's just. I don't know. It, it hasn't gone anywhere in the past in any of these POCs that I've kind of watched. Um, I, I guess I, I'm having trouble uh, envisioning what the future for DeFi might look like because on the one hand, you know, Michael, like I know we talked about on our panel back at Das London, right? Like it, it seems very bullish for actually permission DeFi, right? Where all the assets are institutions. They simply cannot interact with a financial system that doesn't do KYC, all that kind of stuff. But I think then you lose a lot of the core advantages of it. Um and then there's this other, I could also see a future where like the Overton window shifts and for whatever reason, geopolitically, people say, oh, actually privacy is like a very good thing. And maybe it's a government that gets out of control. There's like a lot of, uh, you know, abuses of, um, I don't know, the, you know, weaponization of the financial system and people decide like, I actually want privacy in a financial system, in which case permissionless kind of DeFi ends up working. I think the future ends up probably ending between being somewhere in between those two things. And there's probably a permissioned uh, DeFi and a permissionless DeFi. But um, I guess for me and my own personal interest, I think that probably the permissionless one would be more interesting for, for me, not saying it will not saying it will be larger or more impactful, but like for me, that's kind of where I want to spend my like, career, you know? So I think there'll be big permission mm-hmm. DeFi, but I, I just don't see it as being as personally interesting to me. Um, that's kind of my, my thought. Yeah. Unless unless the products that you could access are differentiated. So, like, w- one thing that we were talking about is, like, where can you buy uh, a 10-year treasury bond on chain right now? You can't. Yeah. Okay. Like, you literally have to go to a prime brokerage or a brokerage account and buy it. If you, you know, signed up for a brokerage account and that gave you access to buy it on chain, like, I would totally do that. Yeah. So, like, if the product differentiation is, is there relative to the permissionless, uh, public permission DeFi versus permissionless. I, I think that would drive more interest from a retail perspective, but I, I agree with you. What up? Yeah, like the yields in DeFi are so cyclical that they're levered, you know, super levered to the cycle. 
having a counter cyclical business like TradFi and all of the yields and all of the bonds and stocks that they have brought on chain, like that helps make crypto more defensible, which is really, really good. I think at the end of the day, permissionless finance and like crypto Twitter and, and crypto culture and, and Ethereum, like that's part of like a movement. You know, like the hippies in the 60s, you know, like that was a movement. I think that roughly the same thing is happening right now. Permissioned finance, that can never really be a movement. It can't be the core of it. It can be something you staple onto the margins of it, but it's never going to be the thing that pushes it forward. Yeah, I'd completely agree with that. Um, I also, you know, par part of me too, like I do see some of the, like the innovation is good. I, there's like not an enormous amount of innovation in finance. There are a lot of poor incentives, I think, that work that way. But also sometimes you see... Also, sometimes you see people doing these things in crypto that I, at least I don't agree with. Like, let's take FTT. There, there has been this idea that you can create a token out of nowhere, which is basically very risky, very volatile, early stage equity. And that's like good collateral to dump in a pool and get USDC out of. And I like if, if maybe this is my own risk tolerance, like, you know, I'm more on the conservative side of things. But like, I kind of feel like that's a recipe for is that there's a lot of that that goes on basically and i think there there is at least some benefit right to having maybe some guidelines uh to things so <laughs> yeah it's like absolutely not <laughs> <Yeah>. no <laughs> nah <laughs> rip it <laughs> send <Yeah>. it <laughs> i don't know i mean one of one of the biggest things one of the biggest things that i think about a lot you know as investors is you know and one of the most important components of the sec in terms of companies is whether or not insiders are selling don't you want to know whether yeah. or not someone who started a protocol who owns 5% of it still has their 5% or every single time that they sell, they have to register that sale? Like, that's really important information that people should know before they invest in it. Um, like that that type of stuff, I think, is is the rule set that yeah. we're talking about here. And, and I think that we could actually do with a lot of that type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have, I have well, well, I can, I can tell you guys one more prediction actually okay. on this about the whole uh, the yields. I think circle is going to start to print unreal revenue and i think there are going to be a bunch of businesses that start to challenge them like they have a sweet business and their business is literally buy super short dated super liquid treasuries and earn billions of dollars <laughs> like that's straight up their business right now and i think a bunch of companies are going to look at that and be like oh i'd actually like to compete like coinbase is starting to compete for some of those yields with circle they're trying to get in in a way because they have the center consortium together and they have a, a revenue split based on where the USDC is custodied. So that's, I think, the best way to understand like the PSM thing and Maker. And they'll probably go and hunt for USDC deposits so they can boost up that. Like, There's a really important line item for them on their on their income statement, which is they've got, they're talking about their subscription, like other revenue, right? We're not a transaction-based business. Yeah, we have other. Um, and an enormous part of that right now is uh, interest, actually, that they generate. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so let's, uh, I mean, great transition if you want to talk about it. it. Is, I, I messed out. up. It's 5.30. Um, it's 5.30. They're coming out. So yeah, we're going to miss it by like an hour. No, no, no. No, Earning, earnings are out. Earnings are oh, out. Really? The call is at 5.30. Oh, nice. Let's go. Um, but uh, so I, I, I actually think Coinbase is also one of the hugest benefactors of this as well, because who would you trust more to custody your assets, Circle or Coinbase? Yeah. And if you're custodying your USDC with Coinbase, they get they get that cut. I mean, it, it is, I think, what happens when, like, we're going to go into a world, and this is one of the things we were talking about with treasuries on chain, where, like, r real risk-free rate yield is going to be 4 plus percent, at least probably for a little while. Whether or not that persists into, like, 2024 remains to be seen. But at least for a while, you're going to have um, some pretty pretty reliable sources of yield. And I think, you know, the, the places like Coinbase are, are going to uh, benefit from it. Once again, one of the things that you see in this Q3 breakdown, which I've been looking at in the background for the last five minutes. What a do you, I... big miss, though. Big miss on Coinbase earnings, huh? Big miss, but look at the stock. Yeah. Because they missed less than people thought they would miss? No, they missed. I I so what are the results? Can you read them, Michael? My guess here... Yeah, so they had net revenue of 576 million, 366 of which was transaction revenue, 211 of which was subscription and services revenue. Uh, so the shift from transaction to services is happening faster than people expected, it seems. Um, they had Q2, so these are the numbers Q2 to Q3, uh, 
trading it doesn't have trading revenue but volume of of q2 was 217 billion volume for q3 was 159 billion whereas subscription and services revenue went from 147 to 211 q2 to q3 respectively so it it is increasing at a faster rate than people expected and that's why i think you see the stock trading flat right now yeah did you see even even though they missed you know estimates by 50 what's their million. EBITDA does it say at what you're looking at because uh, the reason I'm asking is Coinbase is basically guided investors towards uh negative 500 million in EBITDA on the year so basically they can lose like as long as they're losing only losing an EBITDA like 220 million or something like that this quarter to 210 to 230 something like that if they basically keep that loss relatively steady volumes don't completely collapse and they grow their subscription, this uh, the stock was always going to go up because the street has basically priced in yep. declining uh, transaction revenue. And they're totally fine with that. Exactly. It was 116 million uh, net adjusted EBITDA loss for the quarter. Oh, that's like way above. That's way above expect. They were projected to lose. So, like better so, that's yeah. the, that, so that's the other thing. What they guided, what the outlook was for Q3 was approximately a billion in R and D spend with 400 million in stock based comp um, for sales and marketing. They were 25% lower than their expectations. And for R and D, they were about 10% lower than their expectations. Mm-hmm. So costs were actually lower than expectations and transaction revenue up or sorry, uh, subscription revenue up. They're, they're probably, you know, they, they fired the CPO or, you know, he left you know this week, like, you know, you you read that article at that period of time for a specific reason, and you know they knew what the financials were, and so they couched that with with like re- something really important generally with news and everything that comes up is like every picture that you see in every story, every headline, every like it's all there for a reason. It's all very pro forma, prescripted, you know, whatever you want to call it. Like this feels like they're trying to you know this is like the turn. We fired the CPO who you know bageled a bunch of stuff. You know the transaction. You know it's coming down. Services are going up. Like, I would not be surprised if this is the start of of a more sustainable run for Coinbase. This is the rip to, rip the band aid period. This is the rip the band aid period, right? The guy who everyone made fun of that you paid way too much. We'd like go. Yeah. We're gonna find yeah. a new CPO. Yeah. Yeah. Still, still burning five hundred million a quarter. Not. They not bad, they got. But no, they, no, 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 <laughs> no. That was that was net income. Yeah, that was net income. Not that wasn't cash. They also have like six billion in cash. Uh, to burn, they're like they've got such a big cushion. They honestly, um, honestly, they have six. But oh, I thought I'm kind four. of a bull. Right? I mean, they've done everything uh, right. They had the criticism of Coinbase was they're trying to do way too many things. They've grown headcount way too much. They're super levered to transactions. Like they had to reduce their headcount, right? They had to get their expenses in line. They had to grow their subscription line item, which basically seemed impossible. And they're kind of doing it. Um, and they they actually might be a, a monster in. I mean, I wonder how that 200 million or whatever breaks out, but. Uh, I I wonder how much of that is staking. I think I think they might they they might have like a monster staking business on their hands. Frankly, uh, they do, yeah. they do. They have a million CB ETH. They probably got you know I think like four or five or six million staked centralized ETH. Like they are by far the biggest ETH staker that we know of. Um, yeah. And that so is going to be blockchain. Is, in in so so Mike, here we go. Uh, it blockchain rewards staking um basically in line from last quarter custodial fee revenue slightly down from last quarter um other subscription services and services revenue which is i, I would imagine like coinbase cloud that's up and when, exactly the biggest one uh last quarter it was 32 and a half bill, uh, 32 and a half million from interest income yeah. this quarter is 102 million Look at that. So it's up 3x. That's wild. And they quarter over that quarter. and they just got yeah. their whole PSM thing. That's 1.6 billion going in and they they like basically assume uh 50% of I mean that that sorry, let's let's assume you have, they have to pay 1.5% of that to maker and then they probably get another yeah. like mm-hmm. but they're making at least 4 Yeah, 4 4% uh, yeah, at it. least. That's what that's what 3 month treasury bills. That's like the most liquid thing you can, you know, short term short duration thing you can buy. Um, and they got to pay some of that to circle, but that's going to be like tens of millions, uh, in additional income there. And they'll probably run that back with multiple DeFi protocols. I bet you're going to see that Coinbase institutional team <laughs> slide into the DMS or onto the forums of a whole bunch of different, uh, 
big DeFi protocols because this was pretty successful for him. Yeah. It's not just the protocols Sad. though. If you look at if you look at the earnings from uh, twelve months ago, ten percent of like so they have this, this like top one hundred hedge fund list. Uh, Coinbase in, la in twelve months ago earnings said ten percent of those hundred are uh, custodying and like trading crypto with Coinbase. Today's earnings announcement said twenty five percent. So it's like at the end mm -hmm. of the day, if you're a big hedge fund and you want to get into trading crypto, like you go to Coinbase and to have twenty five percent of the world's 100 largest hedge funds custodied with you is a they're gonna be the, fine the tough like the tough part though is institutional uh year over year uh obviously is uh tra transaction revenue versus retail yeah is down about 3x yeah. uh yeah. and it's just been bleeding out basically just the institutional side has been bleeding out in addition to retail over the last four quarters custodian revenue which you would assume is going up if that what you're saying you know is true uh, is, is going down, which I think also represents a compression of custodian fees. Like, it, it's it's sort of like, where do you want to store your assets? Well, we're just going to store it at whatever the cheapest place is. It takes, you know, six minutes for us to transact one custodian to the other. Um, so I, I think custodian revenue is really going to take a hit, but it is going to be interest income from USDC as well as uh, staking rewards. Those are going to be the two things that persist. 100%. They all... I actually I actually disagree with that. I, I don't think the the treasury, you know, whatever business is going to persist at all. Like I think you're kind of at an abnormally high, you know, rate for all interest rates. This is kind of like when last year everyone thought the DeFi yields were going to continue forever. I think the same thing is happening here. Um, I don't think this is going to be a sustainable business for them. I think it's going to be something they did that when we look back on it in, in a couple of years, it looks like a, just a moment in time thing. Um, Unless but you really I, believe the hype. I'm not sure I agree. I no, no, you don't you don't have to believe that interest rates stay up. What you have to believe is that more assets come on the platform than interest rates go down. Yeah. Uh, also we we've just reverted to like historically normal interest rates. Like the, these these are not crazy rates. Uh, this is like we were in an aberration before where they were that low, I think. Um, but the if you assume rates stick around at like let's say two, three percent. I would imagine they are able to increase the amount of assets on platform well over two to three X. Two, two, three percent, sure, but like here or higher, I just I fundamentally don't. I will say the what what one thing that's a funky situation is that we've got an inverted yield curve. So usually the short term rates are lower than the the long term rates, and it's weird that's not the case. So probably there is room to fall for short term rates. But last thing, because I know we're going to wrap up soon is that the, the derivatives market like this will probably come up on the so they acquired Fairex uh, Coinbase. And uh, you've heard SBF like lightly talk about this. Um, I, th I think it's a big regulatory battle. But like the market for US derivatives in crypto is still very much anyone's game, I'd say. Um, CME, obviously very storied institution, kind of a head start. I they they will they will <laughs> struggle uh, based on they're, uh, they probably won't move as fast as some of the crypto natives like FTX and Coinbase. And I, I think they will run into challenges. I would, if I had to guess, I'd say Coinbase or FTX split that market. Um, but that, and that's a huge opportunity. It's like a $50 billion market or something like that's large. I have one last thing because I, I know we need to wrap this up, but I do want to in so Instagram, I want to get back to Mike's thing about Instagram and Polygon for a second, because that'll tie into my last question I want to ask here, which is, um, Instagram has just rolled out the ability to basically mint using uh, mint NFTs inside of Instagram using Polygon. You can also like view or sell or something like that with some other things like Flow and, and Solana. Um, big news, obviously Polygon's team is totally crushing it. Um, they, they did that with Reddit as well. I'm curious, well, do you guys think that Polygon ends up declaring independence from Ethereum one day and like becoming their own L1 to try to drive more value back to Matic holders? Because they're working on their own data availability availability layer, and I'm just like, what? It, it feels here. Let me. I'll, the, the the premise of that question. It feels like Matic. It feels like Polygon has basically like their marketing right now is really smart because that they, the the ETH crowd likes them because they're not in the camp of like Avalanche or Solana where like the ETH crowd's like, oh, I don't like the alt L ones. So they're like, oh no, everything that we do on Polygon is good for ETH, but really. If you look at what they're building, like they're building their whole data available, uh, data availability layer, like they're kind of building the full stack of an L1 blockchain. Do they end up like just moving away from ETH so that Matic ends up getting more valuable?
So data availability doesn't mean, yeah, data availability doesn't mean that they move away from ETH. It just means that what they put onto ETH is is smaller. Uh, uh, Arbitrum is also building its own data availability, data sampling uh, component, which I, I can't remember what they're called, but like they're any, they're like any trust or something like Arbitrum. Anyways, the, the like L3, basically supernet equivalent for Arbitrum is with a known set of validators who are going to be performing data availability, data sampling. And then one or two of those validators will put that call data on chain. I think that that will be kind of the playbook that Polygon runs as well, um, because you're still going to need some trusted settlement layer. It's just a question of like what you're putting on chain that, uh, you know, is, is kind of the core question here. I still think that that's ETH. Yep. Yeah, and you know, ETH is going to be the payment token for uh, their zk uh, solution for the POA chain as well. Like, like they're doing the work to align themselves with ETH. I think in good faith. Um, and yeah, like, I think if they were to break from ETH right now or in the next three or four years, they wouldn't be strong enough to basically fend off competition from people who run the Polygon playbook. But like three years back in time, just kidding. We're the real, you know, L twos, and we have yeah. the best. It's like you know hot ball of money, hot ball of users. Yeah. It all is kind of the same thing. I, I, let me just ask this question to close it. Like Instagram rolling out NFT. I, I have a real, I don't have to feel like I've got a good smart take or thought on like the interaction between Instagram rolling out NFTs. Like do people buy NFTs or use them through Instagram or how, how do those two things collide? I just don't understand it. I'll be honest. I don't have a good thought. This is the, this is the classic mistake of like, if I just get 1% of this huge market, I'm going to be gigantic. Yeah. You know, the better idea is I want to get 100% of the weird crypto degen activity that's happening on ETH and the weird people who use it. And maybe that'll be a big market someday. But we're doing the thing because it's small. We like it. feels like a movement. Um, I hope it plays out like the Reddit NFT stuff. It's just it's hard to get people to use stuff that they're not familiar with. Um, and I think that's the core problem that they're going to have. The counterpoint to that, and, and once again, to go back to what we talked about last week with NFTs and IAP, I think Instagram just sees this as an opportunity now that Apple has blessed this to be able to actually sell NFTs in app and not have it be that much of a infrastructure overhead lift for them to enable this. If people really want to, like, think about it. We just talked about how many people work at Instagram who work at Meta. You know, they're probably like 5 p.m. sitting around one day and like a team of 25 engineers who are like twiddling their thumbs waiting for some work to do. And they see Apple come out with new guidelines, and now it's like, okay, great. Let's go off and build that and see if it works. Like, n no stand off our backs. And that's exactly, like, the process, I think. I don't think this is, like, a structured, strategic move. I think this is more just, like, cool, guidelines say this, let's go do that. Wouldn't, I mean, just hearing you say that, actually, wouldn't that be kind of interesting? I mean, that's, like, the one of the bigger monopoly. I know they've got better PR and everything, but Apple, their app store business is the definition of a monopoly, in my, in my opinion, right? Like, and they, their take rate is enormous, right? 30% or 15% or whatever it is. Uh, it would be interesting if that was one of the developments that actually pushed people towards Web3 because they don't want to pay that arduous take rate. Um, uh, but once again, as Yano said, what what phone are you going to use that's not an iOS device? You have to pay the take rate. I don't rate. want a green text. Yeah, I do not iPhone. want a green text. Yeah, it's we, awful. It, I, I don't <laughs> want you bringing green text. Seri I now. do too. It feels dirty. I, a, I, I hate do it. Do you want to hear a true story? you want to hear a true story? I have I have a brother and a sister, and uh, we my brother's not in my group chat with my family because he has a, he has a green text. <laughs> <laughs> Fun one, guys, this week. I will, uh, we'll see you all next time.